are Smart City Navigators, a podcast about innovation, sustainability, and new technologies on the market. This podcast is brought to you by Navi Parking. Bartosz Czerwinski, engineering leader with 15 plus years of industry experience, passionate about paving the path for high performing teams following continuous delivery at speed, pragmatist and ever learning software craftsman who firmly believes technology is just a tool. What really matters is the right mindset and perseverance. Former CTO at Navi Parking, responsible for product engineering team expansion at an international scale and leading continuous agile evolution toward product revolution, a scalable parking platform of platforms. Co-founder at Shaped Thoughts, a boutique software house that ships great software. Let's welcome Bartosz Czerwinski in today's episode of Smart City Navigators podcast. This episode is a continuation of part one, the episode about cybersecurity. If you are interested about part one, make sure to click the link which is in the description below. And now, let's get back to the second part of the episode about cybersecurity. You mentioned before social engineering, which which is a huge part of a let's say a big scam or a trick that people can use as a exploit exploitative um, method to uh, convince uh, convince people to let's say to transfer some money or exploit any data. So, what is uh, social engineering? Uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a broad term uh, that is focusing on. Uh, using, let's say, psychological methods to basically convince people that they um, uh, to convince people uh, to do certain things, right? It's as as we mentioned before. It's about uh, kind of tricking people. Like, like I want to trick you, so you, for instance, will transfer some money to me, okay? Or I want to trick you to basically uh, share with me some confidential information that you know it's actually pretty secret but at the same time why I don't share my you know um, personal identification identification number with an employee of a bank that is calling me right but now the question would be okay is it actually an employee of the bank calling me or maybe another person so it is a set of methods uh, and techniques that kind of can be used to make people do what you want them to do in the foundation of these kind of tricks uh, using social engineering is pure psychology, right? It's about talking to someone, right? It's about sending them a message or just, you know, doing something that will actually guide you towards a, again, desire, desired uh, kind of activity that this person wants you to perform to get to the target. Let's go back to uh, 80s and 90s, uh, where one of the famous, most famous hackers, Kevin Mitnick, actually the most uh, famous hacker in the world, uh, he actually uh, used social engineering uh, techniques to basically hack people, right? He was not hacking systems. Of course, he eventually got access to different systems and data sets, source code, like proprietary source code, source code from uh, the biggest players at that time, uh, by just hacking people. So he managed to use uh, different psychological tricks. And actually, there are people uh, who call a mitnik a sociopath, uh, you know, a person that basically he's, he has no, um, he does not feel any kind of borders. He just moves on to, you know, get to the target, to do what he wants to do uh, without any doubts. And uh, as I mentioned, he did manage to get secure information, passwords, you know, many, many data, uh, many types of data that he then used to get access to a system, right? And that was done primarily, uh, you know, by talking to people over the phone or even in person, uh, being in certain places and using the fact that all of us are vulnerable to very simple things to meeting people who just feel that we feel we trust from you know just even the first uh, the first meeting and then being kind of put towards uh, a number of steps that 
in total form an attack and lose data, right? Or lose money. Hmm. And this is the crazy thing about this entire social engineering. It was known in 80s and 90s and 2000s, and it's still going on, right? It's sort of digital right now because of AI, but it's still, it's the same mechanism, right? Yes, absolutely. And it's not even full digital because many times, I mean, even myself, right? I, I was facing uh, this year a couple of times a situation where I received a phone call uh, from someone that is saying that, hey, I'm the you know employee of a bank. Actually, the bank I have accounts in, right? So that was the first thing that sounded to me quite safe, okay. And basically, uh, this person uh, was trying to pass to me a message and uh, they said uh, that because this message is sensitive, right? So again, next thing, okay, sensitive message that might be important to me. Uh, they want to ask me a few verification questions, mm-hmm. right? And basically things which are, again, very sound very simple about, hey, so what's your date of birth? Okay, you should know that because you are my bank, right? And you probably know that, but you know to ensure that you call uh, you actually reach the, the, the right person, which is again myself. And basically, uh, this is very um, like, like you can easily fall into a trap where even in a digital world, where you can receive a you know ransom email that is asking you to uh, do something, and then you do something or you click something. Uh, because you feel uh, interested about the thing, right? Uh, you get into trouble. Same over the phone, right? You answer a few questions, and then in the next few days, you receive a notification from your real bank saying, "Hey, we received um, a request uh, for a loan, right?" And then you say, "What? I didn't want to have a loan. Do you want to take a loan?" So it's it's really um, simple to get into not that simple trouble by being tricked by someone who just got a few bits of information about you that are you know sufficient to perform certain type of uh, activities you know in the web also people can gather those informations even straight from the social media right people are posting like you said a picture with a dog from a park people are constantly feeding those uh, algorithms of their data and their data are like very vulnerable assets. I guess many uh, of your friends, uh, I guess also maybe yourself, uh, because you are a person that is, let's say, um, very available on the web uh, and or maybe very present on the web, uh, put their full name in the social media, right? So it's not that hard to identify uh, who you are, to find many bits of information of data about uh, where you live, uh, whether you have any pets and so on. So if you look at, for instance, uh, popular um, mail providers, uh, there is a security mechanism uh, that is known from, again, many years back, 90s, about a security question, right? So if you lose access to your account, then you can use security question to retrieve the access or at least go through a path of getting or resetting the password. So many of those questions uh, that are suggested by default, because I guess most of the uh, accounts or providers I've been uh, using, they usually suggest questions. So many of those questions are about simple things like, what is the name of your pet, right? Or what's the color of your car, right? Or where do you live? Uh, And so on and so forth. So those questions are very simple. And why simple? Because the answer has to be simple to remember since it's a recovery type of question. Uh, And then you can easily find the answer on the web, right? So it's not that difficult. So that's why these days uh, security systems are, again, more uh, sophisticated and more mechanisms are... Uh, put into place to make sure uh, no one can get that easy access to the account. And one of the mechanisms that is very popular is called multi-factor authentication, right? Uh, It's again um, a thing that not every system has implemented. However, uh, I guess in the next few years, actually it will be a de facto standard for every system because we know 
and security specialists know that just a password and a username is not sufficient, right? In the past, uh, yes, it was, I guess, uh, less difficult to, uh, maybe not less difficult, but uh, it was basically more secure since uh, if the password is complicated enough, it wasn't that easy to get access to it. However, these days where the data is traveling around the world and you can much more easily, for instance, uh, even get sometimes in the middle uh, there is of even an attack called man in the middle attack where someone wants to get in the middle between you and the system somehow to basically steal the data right or steal the access tokens so with multi-factor authentication uh, we ensure that even though you know the password uh, even though you know the username uh, if you for instance uh, access your account from a new device uh, then the system detects that and says okay give me the second factor which can be a one-time password or some kind of security code so even like by default uh, you can say uh, to your kind of system that hey every time i log in ask me about password and the secret right mm -hmm. and the secret can be again uh, one of the um like authenticator app, uh, one-time password, uh, a security device, even physical security device, but basically something that you know you only have, right? Access to, at least that's what you what you think. <laughs> so, is there is there any other like tips for people who are listening to this podcast how to protect ourselves, or even do you have any like um, advices for companies, for startups, for organizations how they can protect their data? When you talk about users, uh, the, the first thing to be um, kind of aware of is that uh, by default, you can't trust your device, okay? It basically, anything can happen, even though you may be super aware and secure in terms of what, what not to click, what not to open, what messages not to read. Uh, you can give your device you know, to anyone, like your friend or your child, and say, okay, just play around, uh, you know, there is a new game I just downloaded, you can use it, and then in that game there is an advertisement being presented that this person clicks and actually it navigates you towards a malicious website uh, that will download malicious software and then you are done, right? So you don't even know that potentially someone has installed uh, a, a software uh, that can uh, in the next number of days or weeks steal your data. So first of all, you have to be cautious. That's first rule, right? And these days we receive tons of messages from everywhere. Social media, emails, uh, websites, you know, ads, uh, banners, basically data is everywhere. And also uh, malicious data and software is everywhere. So we have to be, we have to be cautious that I do not open things I don't know, right? And again, it's difficult because if you receive a message, uh, as you mentioned before, as an example, uh, about a package that you expect, uh, and then you see, okay, there is a message that asks me to do something about my package, then you can easily fall into this trap. But you have to be cautious by reading it carefully. Okay, what does it say, right? Because quite often, uh, like we live in Poland, and most of, I mean, actually all companies uh, that you can let's say use to order a package they will communicate you with uh, they will communicate to you uh, in polish right and if there is a let's say outside uh, from poland uh, a, a hacker group that is trying to uh, do some kind of phishing by sending you a message then most likely they don't know polish and they will send you a message uh, that is translated into polish via google translate or any other service yes. and it won't be pretty you know, good language, right? So be aware, be aware that those little signs show that there's something wrong. Of course, uh, when we talk about web, we have to talk about links, hyperlinks. Uh, those links are always uh, looking strange. And when there is a strange link, it means that, okay, shall I trust it? Most likely not. So again, awareness, right, as the first thing and uh, staying uh, vigilant uh, about the world around you that that piece of information may not be actually uh, the one I'm looking for. Uh, secondly, um, especially, let's say, I mean, both power and non-power users, but basically users that uh, know that they 
uh, they are not like tech sa savvy pr uh, people uh, use uh, anti malware antivirus software it's good to have something installed uh, on your device uh, even on mobile phone and uh, make sure that there is something that is actually looking uh, you know towards uh, activities that uh, may uh, harm you or your device uh, that is also a, a very good practice uh, because that software was designed to protect you right and uh, even going like further uh, towards that kind of software if you look at your computer uh, most modern systems they offer a firewall uh, it's a software that uh, actually is intended to protect uh, your computer against malicious traffic coming from the computer network not only internet but even like local network because you can imagine that your computer that you have uh, on your desk uh, might be infected because someone like it can be you know super clean but then someone is coming to the office with infected computer puts that computer on the desk connects to the same network and then that infected computer can actually execute uh, malicious code to detect other devices on the network and see whether those devices actually have some vulnerabilities that could be used to get access to it right and then install some or inject some um, malicious software so uh, it's really complicated right so that's why um, you know not turning on services you don't know uh, not installing applications you don't know and even if some, if it's something fancy that you know someone sent you hey there's a new app a new game just try it out actually those new things are in most cases um, uh, let's say insecure in a sense that if it's new and it wasn't you know let's say tested uh, properly or uh, kind of let's say evaluated by a number of uh, of, of people uh, and it might be actually a super cool looking app that was deployed by a hugger that saying hey let's just use you know like viral type of marketing and social media to distribute that and then people download use it and I get the data and I'm done right and I can just delete the app and move on so you just need to be really really aware about that that don't install those things and, and what about public hotspots? Are, are they safe or hotspots in cafes, in public places? Anything that is in public is unsafe by definition, especially when you can get access to an uh, unsecure network, uh, like you know, Wi-Fi, uh, because many of them, they, are, uh, they, they don't even use encryption um, in terms of traffic, right? So basically, when you connect to a hotspot, uh, and you see on your computer that this and again most modern systems they do tell you whether you're connecting to a secure or insecure network and this secure versus insecure it doesn't mean a total security but it means whether uh, the transmission between your device and a hotspot is encrypted if it's not encrypted then the risk is even higher why because if there is um, a, a person that wants to like a person that wants to get any information about anyone uh, this person can get next to the hotspot turn on their laptop with a dedicated uh, you know device card in a pernicious mode and basically listen to the traffic in the air right because we know that these days uh, Wi-Fi at home at work hotspot and so on is the standard used for transmitting data right people do not use cables I mean actually I do use cable at my home but <laughs> Uh, for not only security reasons mm -hmm. however um, if you stay you know in public it will be like a wireless connection so that data travels there somehow and if it's not encrypted then believe me basically whatever is being sent between your machine and there uh, you can read that information right mm -hmm. and of course here we have let's say additional layers of security and we can talk about encryption of um, data being sent between your browser and the server so for instance when you connect to your even you know like mail provider or um, online transaction service uh, from your bank and then of course uh, those companies they do offer a TLS or SSL type of security uh, that basically ensures that the traffic between the server and you as the end user is encrypted and that means that the data if you were like connected to a hotspot that is public without encryption then with the encryption that your provider guar guarantees between your browser and the server you still would be 
much safer, right? Because you cannot easily read the data. However, still you can see the transmission uh, that is happening. So yeah, it's these are very risky places. So first of all, uh, do not perform any uh, activities in that networks that can uh, like that. That are kind of let's say secret secure, right? For instance, if you if you wanted to do a money transfer uh, to someone. Uh, in a hotspot, public hotspot, that it's pretty insecure in a sense that it can, it may not be even a user that is trying to connect to your device or somehow steal the data in between, but it may be also a person standing behind you and looking at your keyboard, right? What do you type or even what's the, you know, n um, amount of money you, you keep on your account because it's not that difficult to just watch your screen uh, when you are nearby. So, and here we talk about physical security, right? How to protect against those those yeah. things. So essentially, in public hotspots, if you want to just do some browsing, read some news, and so on, that's pretty much okay. Uh, but also be aware that uh, many uh, many uh, kind of companies that uh, provide um, web services like websites, they still do not rely on uh, certain security mechanisms and protocols. That protect your that protect your data, you know, traveling from your browser to uh, to that hosting provider, and and, and that's sad, right? Because th there are you know tools and standards they could implement, but basically they don't, and then you feel that okay, I'm you know in a hotspot connecting to your website, but because you didn't check, it's not encrypted, right? And it's using HTTP protocol, not HTTPS. Then basically anyone sitting there. Who has the skill can see what you are reading, right? And if you read like I don't know a portal about politics, maybe right this person will actually see um, what is the party you are voting for or whatever. But it's a again it's a risk because easily getting information uh, about your life uh, is, is something we don't want to happen. Hmm. And there is a one a very simple walk around for uh, let's say for a solution for public uh, hotspots. I use my own hotspot, right? I just share my internet from my phone to my laptop when I'm on the public uh, public places. Yeah, it is a solution, uh, but you also have to be aware that um, by using your own hotspot, you still connect you connect to the network uh, via in this case your uh, mobile provider, yeah. right? And uh, this, uh, let's say, hacking into a hotspot uh, which is uh, Wi-Fi based is much easier. Basically, technology is simpler and it's uh, accessible to anyone. You can buy a card for about I don't know, you know, twenty bucks, and uh, use that card, uh, as I mentioned before, in a permissions mode to actually uh, collect the data from the air uh, with. Uh, LT networks or even you know three or four G, uh, it's not that easy. But also there are technologies, right? But of course they are not that accessible and super expensive. So essentially, if there is a you know homemade hacker that wants to just go around and you know get access to uh, to the data in the air that is being transmitted from your mobile to the network, it's much more difficult. But definitely uh, this way you can stay much more secure because you use your own hotspot. And why it's more secure? First of all, because it's not only about you know the kind of security standards and encryption that is being uh, implemented by the provider, but it's also because it's only you using this, right? And if there are no other devices on the network, then um, it's harder to uh, perform basically attacks on your device and yourself. Hmm. Okay, so we have a personal security, and what about the company's security, company's data? How companies uh, supposed to protect the data? As I mentioned before, uh, the weakest link uh, in a security systems is human being, right? They are unpredictable. So one of the things which um, may sound pretty simple is to make the users and employees of a company aware about securities like first of all security procedures security uh, mechanisms that are implemented are, on, are in place but also about potential security threats but also 
security threats that actually happen, right? And um, this awareness, which also includes training uh, staff, uh, and here we talk about, you know, like regular users being trained how to use antivirus software or how to use some other type of uh, security software, but also training uh, professionals like engineers how to write a code so it's secure, right? Or how to use, I don't know, security scanners to ensure security. Uh, this is something that uh, should be uh, essentially present uh, in a company uh, to make sure that the information about, again, overall security is kind of spread and people increase their, aware uh, their awareness. Also, hiring professionals uh, that can perform security audits to check the infrastructure or check your, you know, applications, products you are building, whatever, uh, is pretty important. Uh, because uh, the fact is that even you have you know a super um, skilled developers engineers that are building your product uh, rarely they do are that skilled in security right it's basically a trade that requires a lot of um, learning uh, requires a lot of effort to understand how systems work uh, you know top down right uh, and uh, the, the kind of difficulty also lies in the fact that there are every day there are many new threats coming and you just need to stay up to date and it's difficult right so of course you can hire a security engineer or even a chief security officer that will be uh, working on making sure that uh, the company is again abiding by certain rules and standards but also making people aware yeah, and then also making sure that uh, periodically, uh, the, like security scans or checks are being performed, to to make sure that nothing bad happens. So as I mentioned before, it's a continuous process that is uh, multidimensional and requires uh, incorporating uh, things like uh, dedicated software for uh, security measures, but also making sure, for instance, that uh, automated security testing. Uh, of your products is performed uh, and and so on and so forth so I would say this is the core uh, that you have to be aware of uh, when leading a company that uh, provides software for users especially if it's like a, a cloud-based software uh, to to keep it secure so many details so many uh, like uh, pieces of information from you so uh, to sum up entire episode or two parts of this episode what's the ultimate goal of uh, security even not even in the companies but also as a human being how to stay secure no matter where you are a individual that just wants to use latest technology trends or a company uh, that builds you know great software uh, you have to be aware of security as a topic area that requires awareness and investments and um, you have to make sure that you basically you know explore those topics rather than say okay nothing happened to me so far so i'm just you know i'm safe right i like why they would like to hack me whatever just just be aware and uh, make sure you treat security as a first-class citizen. This is a very well-ended uh, second part of, of this two-part episode. And also, uh, like you said, let's invest into getting awareness, right? As a company, let's invest money. As an individual, as a human being, let's invest our time because time is also asset. Let's invest our time to get more information about how to stay protected you know, in this, let's say, digital environment. So, Bartosz, really, really uh, huge thank you for, for this uh, two-part episode about security. And I hope to see you on the next episode of a Smart City Navigators podcast. Thanks a lot. And thank you for the invitation one more time. Thank you for listening to Smart City Navigators podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Join the conversation by leaving a comment and sharing your thoughts. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode in which we'll do another deep dive into a topic related to innovation, sustainability and new technologies. See you next time.